For equity investors interested in using shares as a source of income, one number matters probably more than all the others, and that is the dividend yield. So in this video, we'll look at why it's so important and roughly how it's calculated, and then I'll point out one or two pitfalls of relying solely on it as a guide to generous income paying stocks. Okay, so with no more ado, why do we buy shares? Where do dividends and income fit into the overall picture? Well, principally, most people buy shares for one of two good and one subsidiary reason. The two good ones, capital gains. We expect shares to go up more than they go down, but that's not the subject of this video specifically. What I'm gonna focus on is the income side of things. Easily forgotten how important income is to your long-term return from shares. But let's not forget, there are perks available too. Some companies offer discounts on products and services and so on. But really, this video is all about income. Now, why is income so important to your overall wealth as an equity investor? Well, in a nutshell, here's the answer. Let's take a look at the FTSE 100 over quite a long period. All right, so kicking off back in 1985 and finishing way over in October 2013, this is the FTSE 100, the leading index of UK shares, and we're going to do it from two perspectives. Capital only, not thinking about income, and total return. That's capital returns and income returns, assuming that when a company pays a dividend, you don't take it out and spend it, you reinvest it and let it work for you. Now, here come the two lines. There goes the fatter total return line. That's the one with dividends included. And there goes the spindlier capital only line. Now, so far, so what? Well, one observation straight away. This line bobs up and down more severely than that line. That tells you something. It tells you that once you factor in income or reinvest in dividends, you smooth out a little bit of the volatility in terms of the overall return that you achieve. That's quite handy. More importantly, what is that return? Well, Let's put in the starting points. So for the capital only version of the index, not factoring income, 1412 becomes 6721. Not bad, that's, uh, well, 6721 is almost five times. 1412, not bad, but look at this. Total returns 356 turns as an index into 4885. Well, that's pretty huge. That's getting on for, what, 14 times the starting level? So you can see, you get a bit less volatility of income reinvested and the total return can be pretty impressive. So we now know, or we've been reminded, that income matters. Dividend yields are a way of screening stocks to try and find the best income payers. So how does it work? Well, the dividend yield calculation is superficially quite simple. It takes the dividend per share. Now, if I told you that was 10p, how would I have done that? Where'd I get that from? Well, there are two ways you can calculate a dividend yield. You can do it on a historic basis, but most investors are looking to the future, want to know what, you know, what could happen, so it's often done on a forward basis. But in both cases, the 10p is an annual dividend, so companies sit down, they decide what proportion of their profits to pay out as dividends. So it's the total dividend divided by the number of shares in issue. All right, so in very, very simple terms, if a company were to pay a total dividend of say 10 million pounds, and there are um, 100 million shares in issue, 10 million pounds over 100 million would be the 10B I'm suggesting there. Divided by the current share price, well I can look that up, and let's say that's 200 pence. 10P as a percentage, this is the key, it's called a yield for that reason, of 200 pence is about five. So what, 5%? Well, immediately, with any ratio like this, any number, you need something to compare it to. Is 5% good or bad? Well, 5%, is that higher or lower than the average dividend yield offered by FTSE 100 companies? If that's, let's say, 3.5%, 5 looks good. If my bank account only pays 1%, 5 looks good. If UK government IOUs only offer a yield of 2.5%, 5 looks pretty good. If inflation is around 2%, five looks pretty good. So you can see what I'm doing is benchmarking here. I'm picking something to compare that number to. That's a key part of using any ratio by itself. It doesn't mean anything. But even once I've decided that 5% is good, gotta be very careful. Now, why? 
High yielding shares are in principle what you're after. If you're looking to put together a nice diversified portfolio that's gonna pay you a decent income, get that dividend reinvestment, then great. Yeah, clearly I'm looking for high yield shares or higher yield shares. But watch out for what I've called here the value trap. All right, now that can be defined a number of different ways, but sometimes sectors where their best days are behind them tempt you in as an investor by offering generous yields. They're effectively saying, well, our growth days are behind us, so you know, we can just about, you know, we're probably cash generative, we can afford to keep paying dividends just about, so in you come, right, value traps. In other words, all you're going to ever get is the dividend yield. Um, affordability. Dividends do get cut sometimes. Even the biggest companies in the market cut their dividends, as BP demonstrated a few years ago. You need to just ask the question, a company may have offered us a 5% yield last year, but can it maintain the dividend? So you'll be looking at other things, which we'll cover in later videos, such as cash flow and uh, dividend coverage, the ability to pay dividends out of cash and profits. All right, so just watch out for that. Uh, by itself, a high dividend yield is a good starting point, but there are other questions you need to ask. Now, as an investor, you're gonna go hunting around, thinking, well, where do I get these things? Where do I get these higher yielding stocks? Well. At the time this video was put together, the higher than average, higher than the wider market sectors, if you want to see it that way, included utilities, pharmaceuticals, tobacco, oil and gas, and food retail. But do be careful, in one or two of these cases, you could argue that the reason they're offering higher than average yields is their best growth days are behind it. And sectors that are sometimes on the wane or you know, facing constraints on growth sort of almost have to offer decent yields to justify their existence, because if you're not getting a half decent yield and you're not getting growth, why buy the stock at all? Lower than average yields. Now, on the right-hand side, I'm not saying these will always be lower than average, but they tend to be. Often the reason is they're, they're putting their, their money into growth. They're not paying dividends, they're putting their money into growth, so technology qualifies there, for example, um, or they're capital intensive. All right, so, so you know, a lot of their money goes into reinvestment or maintaining their asset base. So different reasons, they're not write-offs. I mean, if you can get decent growth out of a share, you may be prepared to sacrifice some of the income you'd otherwise receive, but you wouldn't go looking on the right-hand side normally for higher than average yields. So there it is. All I'm suggesting in this video is that the dividend yield is a crucial tool in the armory of an investor, particularly looking for decent income, Income matters over the long term, but like any number, don't rely on it purely at face value. Make sure you ask the questions, test it, kick the tires, look under the bonnet, and just satisfy yourself that a good yield today will remain a good yield tomorrow.